Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Please take this opportunity to move to your seats so we may begin the program on time. Please welcome AFA's Central Florida, Martin H. Hap Harris Chapter President, Todd Fries. Thank you. 36 years ago, our chapter established this great symposium and has been working closely with AFA to keep it one of the premier professional development events for airmen. Today is our honor to participate in continuing that great tradition by hosting this session. I am pleased to introduce our keynote event to, include, to conclude our symposium. Lieutenant General John Thompson is responsible for approximately 6,000 airmen worldwide. He commands an annual budget of over $7 billion to support the research, design, development, launch, acquisition, and sustainment of satellites and their associated command and control systems. Accompanying General Thompson is global innovator Elon Musk. In 1980, <laughs> in 1983, he taught himself computer programming at the age of 12, 
stole the code for a basic-based video game called Blaster for approximately $500. And in 1990, in 1995, he started Zip2, a web software company later renamed PayPal in 2001. But more recently, you might know him for revolutionizing electric cars as CEO and product architect of Tesla Motors. Development, that's all the Tesla owners. <laughs> Development and manufacturing of advanced rockets and spacecraft for missions to and beyond Earth orbit as founder of Space Exploration Technology, SpaceX. <laughs> and conceptualizing high-speed transportation known as Hyperloop. And if you haven't heard some of these quotes by Elon Musk or Muskisms, let me introduce this one. Here's my first one. And when I first read it, I thought, while it applies to innovation, it's also written into the contract of every airman in this room and every man and woman who has served. And the quote is, if something is important enough, even if the odds are against you, you should still do it. Now, looking back, to our speech this morning by Dr. Roper, when he talked about innovation, one of the Muskism quotes is, failure is an option here. If things are not failing, you are not innovating enough. But my favorite quote, I would like to die on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> General Thompson, Mr. Musk, over to you. Thank you, Thank welcome. You. <laughs> 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 well, Elon, thanks so much for being here today. Um, as you know, and many people in the audience know, we, uh, we're reprising a, uh, a fireless fireside chat uh, that we did at Air Force uh, Space Pitch Day uh, back in November. Uh, I ran into uh, General Goldfein, the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, this morning, and uh, um, maybe I was being a little bit too confident, but I said, hey, I. I think uh, that we did such a good job together at Space Pitch Day that uh, Elon and I got invited back for a much bigger audience, uh, higher stakes and everything like that. And General Goldfein looked at me and went, no, JT, you guys are going to do it until you get it right. <laughs> so, so we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, innovation. Uh, for those of you uh, in the audience that uh, uh, nothing that was introduced about Elon uh, 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 made it to the prefrontal cortex, and you're like, I still don't know who this guy is. Um, you may uh, remember him from the movie role in uh, Iron Man 2, uh, or the TV show uh, uh, The Big Bang Theory. Uh, you may remember him if you're old like me when you used to have to do dial-in modems. Uh, you may remember uh, how PayPal actually worked over a dial-in modem. Yeah. Um, and if, just in case you've had your head in the sand for uh, the last decade, you absolutely have to know him for space exploration technologies, SpaceX, a tremendous partner of the United States Air Force in, uh, uh, in the space business, uh, and for Tesla. So for just, just for grins, this fastest growing auto company on the planet, most amazing uh, capability. And when Elon pulled up, he pulled up, uh, he and his entourage in three different Teslas this morning. How many Tesla owners do we have in the audience? Stand up, stand up if you're a Tesla owner. All right, very nice. <laughs> So, um, Elon, you and I have talked about whether the Air Force uh, is the most innovative service. Um, uh, the Department of the Air Force now, uh, the last time we interviewed, it was, it was just the Air Force. Now we're the Air Force and the Space Force as part of the Department of the Air Force. Most of those people who uh, stood up were in the front row. We have a lot of first adopters uh, here in the front of the audience, apparently, or maybe those are the folks that just make the most money. Who knows? Okay, so... Um, uh, again, today's, uh, today's discussion is about uh, innovation uh, and uh, how we can make the Department of the Air Force the most innovative department within the Department of Defense and perhaps across the United States government. So, Elon, question number one. Um, when you put a weapon system uh, 
uh, or a product into production and you start delivering it to your customers. Very, very frequently there is a, a pushback within the production organization that, you know, we don't want to change that product too much. It's successful. We have a lot of legacy systems that we're responsible for in the Department of the Air Force. Um, there is a lot of, uh, of reticence at times to incrementally improve or add new capabilities to those systems. From the context of Tesla and uh, SpaceX, how do you motivate your workforce? How do you work with your customers? How do you work with technologists uh, um, uh, in your ecosystems, your various ecosystems, to try and make sure that products don't become stagnant and they continue to incre incrementally improve over time? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's an honor to be uh, here with you and with, with everyone else from the uh, space slash Air Force. Um, <laughs> um, and um, I've obviously had a long, long relationship with the Air Force and very much appreciate the support over the years. So, so I just want to make sure I, to say that. Um, and look forward to doing a lot of interesting things in the future. Um, I, I think it's actually... Um, it's cool that, 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 that there is, that, that the creation of the Space Force is, uh, is happening. Um, I think it, there's, you know, it, it makes sense that there's a, a major branch for every domain, you know, with the, uh, and, and uh, so the, the domain of space and the domain of error are both important, but uh, I think space, space is, is, uh, is, is certainly a medium of its own. <laughs> sure. Um, and um, I think there's some very exciting things that are possible. Um, if I may just say, like, wh wh what, you know, what the public wants, I think, and actually I'm pretty confident that the public does want this, is a staff lead academy. You know, or like, <laughs> yeah. Like, how do, we make Star how do we make Star Trek real, you know? That'd be pretty amazing. I'd, I'd love that. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, so I think like the fastest we can make sort of Starfleet real, then we just try to do that. <laughs> um, well, so Elon, yeah. speaking speaking for uh, the United States Space Force, there already is a Starfleet Academy. It's the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Sure. <laughs> yep, I, I've, I've I've been there. I've given a talk and. Um, you know, the, the first launch of Falcon 1, we had a Falcon sat from the, the Air Force Academy. Um, that, that rocket blew up, but, the, it, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the, but then the funny thing is that it blew up, it, it, like he's this truth is stranger than fiction. Um, the, the satellite uh, w was shot through the fairing, um, off through the air a, a couple hundred meters, and then plunged through the roof of a tool shed uh, and then landed on the floor. Um, and was actually in reasonably good shape. I mean, for crashing through the ceiling, but you know, you're like recognizable, you know. Um, and, and we, gave, we gave, so gave it back and so we, we've not lost one of your satellites. <laughs> so, so from a SpaceX Just perspective, buff it a, out. a partial mission success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, well, it's, it's not lost, I'm just saying. <laughs> It's a little the worse for it's a little bit worse for wear, but you know, uh, but, but here you go. <laughs> but then we launched, subsequently launched uh, a future Falcon set to actual orbit. Uh, that was great. Um, so, um, so, so I think, I think there's, I think we can make, go a long way towards making Starfleet real and, and making uh, these uh, sort of. Um, Utopian or semi-utopian semi futures real, it, but it will definitely require radical innovation. Um, one can't get there by uh, incrementally innovating um, expendable boosters. There's just no way. Yeah. So the, 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 the I, th I think we we need to push for radical breakthroughs, um, and if you don't push for radical breakthroughs. You're not going to get radical out outcomes, um, and that that does mean taking risks. Um, and and you know, 
common sense that the, the, if you take a big risk, in order to have, have a big reward, there must be a big risk. It's most of the time you cannot find big reward for small risk. That's those are rare. Um, so you're going to have some proportionality with the risk and reward. Um, but if the, if, the, if the goal is important enough, um, and I think I increasingly the, the goal is important for for many reasons. Um, the, 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 the goal of, of having uh, the, the best technology uh, in space, uh, that that is, I think, going to become increasingly important, and it'll be increasingly, increasingly important for the United States to use what I think is its greatest attribute, which is uh, invention uh, and innovation um, to, to create space technology that is um, the best in the world. Um, and, and in fact, I think if the United States does not use uh, breakthrough innovation, uh, it will fall behind. Yeah. So I think this is, th th this is not something that was a risk in times past, but I think is a risk now. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, Do you characterize that risk in terms of peer adversary comp com competition around the planet? Are you, are, you, um, are, are you suggesting that it's our adversaries that require us to be that, those radical innovators? Or is it just we can't become complacent and stay um, uh, incrementally improving our systems? We must take those giant leaps forward um, as a nation regardless of the competition. I think there's there's little, little. I have zero doubt that if the United States does not take, uh, does not s seek great innovations in space, it will be second in space. Okay. With as sure as night follows day. So it is a big deal. Um, but this 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 is a, uh, I mean, a very innovative. The United, there's no country more innovative and, and inventive than the United States. So. It's just important to use that attribute. That's that's the ace card. Okay. Yeah. And since uh, so since it seems like we're going down the geopolitical path here on the on the, the questions, how does the United States as a nation maintain that innovative edge, that that um, uh, uh, ability to invest in things and take those risks? Uh, what kind of uh, of uh, governmental policies or uh, processes do we have to encourage the right kinds of behavior in your view? Well, I, th I think having um, outcome-based procurement is, is actually very important. Okay. Um, so you say like this is the outcome that is sought um, and whoever can achieve this outcome or achieve this outcome to a greater degree, uh, that, that company will, that, that's who the Air Force will do business with and will will procure the thing that is the, that is radically innovative as measured by the, what what is important for leadership in space. Um, <coughs> so, um, I mean, I do think it's it's a absolutely fundamental to achieve full reusability in access to space. This is this is the, the holy grail of space. Um, at the point at which you have full reusability for orbital rockets, then you have uh, a, a profound advantage over a, anyone else. It's profound. Um, it would be like if um, in the Air Force, if, if, you, if you had planes that could be used once, and, or, or if you had, if you had, if you had multi-use planes that could be flown over and over again, like normal, um, and all your adversaries had single-use planes, that would be no contest. It's the same thing in space. Okay. Yeah. This is extremely fundamental. Um, so, the, the the cost of a propellant is typically on the order of one percent of the cost of the of, of the vehicle, or less. So, um, if you have a vehicle that is, say. Know, um, box kerosene, like Falcon 9 or something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the, 
the oxygen and the fuel are, yeah, maybe half a million dollars or something like that. Uh, but then depending upon the mission, the, the mission price can be anywhere from like 60 to 100 million dollars. So, um, now Fal Falcon 9 is a partially reusable vehicle, but not fully. Um, the vehicle we're working on right now, uh, which is quite difficult, is a Starship. And uh, yeah, th th that has the potential for full reusability. Um, but but I think it would be great to have other companies as well that are doing full reusability. I think competition is a good thing. Um, it, it may seem at times that, uh, you know, shouldn't we uh, focus all our efforts on, on one system and ra rather than divide them and have two competing systems? Um, like, you know, n not to cause controversy, you know, or, but like, I mean, in my opinion, like, Joint Strike Fighter, sh there should be a competitor to, to JSF. That, that's, uh, I know it's a controversial subject, but, um, you know, I, th I think it's, it's, not, it's not good to have uh, one, one provider. Um, it's good to have competition wh where that competition is meaningful and somebody can actually lose. That, like, you know, so then, then <laughs> um, so, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so in radical innovation, obviously the workforce is a really key component of that. I mean, as, I mean, during your PayPal days, you were actually doing coding, mm -hmm. right? But in SpaceX and Tesla, they are so large that Elon can't do everything. What sort right. of things do you think about in terms of motivating a workforce like um, uh, like we have in the Department of the Air Force that will help them become more radically innovative? What sort of things do you look for in people or in processes that make the workforce better? Sure, well, I think the massive thing that can be done is to make sure your incentive structure is such that uh, innovation is rewarded and lack of innovation is punished. So you gotta be a carrot and a stick. So uh, if somebody is innovating um, and doing, ma making good, good progress, then they should be promoted sooner. Um, and if somebody is completely failing to innovate, um, not, not every role requires innovation, but uh, if they're in a role where innovation is, sh should be happening and it's not happening, then they should either not be promoted or exited. And let me tell you, you'll get promoted, you'll get, You'll, you'll, you'll get innovation real fast. Okay. <laughs> the stick. Yeah, how, it's like, how much do you want? Yeah. So does that, does that carrot and stick approach help, uh, do you think, people be more risk averse or less risk averse? Well, for when, when, when trying different things, you, you've got to t have some acceptance of failure, uh, as you were alluding to earlier. Failure must be an option. If failure is not an option, it's going to result in extremely conservative choices, and y y you may not you may get something even worse than lack of innovation. Things may go backwards. Um, so, um, if th what you really want is uh, risk, risk to, to, to you, you want reward and punishment to to be proportionate to the actions that you seek. So if, uh, if, if what you're seeking is innovation, then you should reward success and innovation. Um, and only, there should be minor consequences for lack of, minor consequences for, for trying and failing. Those should, should be minor. Um, with significant rewards for trying and succeeding minor consequences for trying and not succeeding, um, and big and, and, and major negative consequences for not trying. Okay. So if, if you have that incentive structure, you will get innovation like you can't believe. Okay. Yeah. So you've, um, you've talked at uh, Tesla shareholder meetings and in various interviews that you consider um, 
the machine that builds the machine yes. uh, to be uh, just as important, if not more important, than the machine itself. Yeah. So we talked about the workforce aspects. Are there processes that you use within your company that are parts of that machine that you think are particularly valuable for innovative, radical change? Well, what I mean by the machine that builds the machine is that the the, the production, the designing the production system of a new product is, I think, at least an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude harder than designing the initial prototype. Yeah. Um, the, and I think, like in America, there's been le less of a le less importance in, in modern times placed on manufacturing, um, and I think this is this is a mistake. Um, um, I mean, like at this point, I would, I would really classify. And in fact, I sent an email to the to SpaceX just saying this. Like, at this point, I think designing a rocket is trivial, just trivial. There's like tons of books that'll you read them. You know, you can understand equations. You can design a rocket. Uh, it's real, real easy. Uh, yeah, right. If you, if you say like two stage. Uh, Two, and two percent of your liftoff mass to orbit. It, from a, just to, to design something like that, piece of cake. Um, uh, now, if you say you want to go into production with that, or if you want, you want to actually make. Let's say the next step is you want to make even one of those things. Okay, now making even one of those things and getting it to orbit is hard, um, but the designing of it is not hard. The making of it is, of even one is hard. The making of a production line that builds and launches many is extremely hard. Mm. Um, and then the, the next level beyond that would be um, uh, a cre creating a fully reusable system and having that be in volume production and volume launch. That's the, that's super super hard. Um, so that's so but yeah, but but by building a machine, it builds a machine. I mean, I mean. Creating the production system, um, and I, I keep emphasizing to SpaceX: the hard part is making it, and making lots of them, yeah. and launching frequently. Because um, reuse must not just be; re it can't be reuse like the shuttle. It's got to be rapid and complete reuse. Uh, so the shuttle was a case where the reuse was very slow, and it was. Uh, not complete. The, the main tank was lost every time, um, and w refurbing the shuttle between flights was extremely expensive. Uh, it, it's not even clear whether it was worth recovering the, the, the booster shells from the ocean. Um, so, so just like an aircraft, you, you, the, the the rocket must be rapidly and completely reusable, and then you need lots of them. Um, and then I've, I've been sort of just the, doing back kind of back of the over envelope of what's, what's needed to establish a self-sustaining city on Mars. And you, these are like big numbers, but I think you need on the order of a million tons to the surface of Mars, useful payload, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we sit on the top of a massive base of infrastructure, or you know, the, the, the economy is, uh, you, you think of all the things that are mined and then refined, and then and then many steps in the refinement, and in order to produce like your phone or your toaster, even there's there's a vast base of industry that was required to produce even a simple household item. Yeah, um, it's very difficult. So, um, so you got to recreate that on Mars. So a million tons on Mars means. And we're just talking orders of magnitude here. Hopefully, it's not 10 million tons, and hopefully, it, it, maybe it's less than a million tons, but probably not 100,000 tons. So th that that means you, you need to get about about 5 million tons to uh, Earth orbit of useful payload. So you're talking like the like. So essentially, unless you have a launch system that is somewhere in the Megaton per year range mm -hmm. to orbit. It's not. It's not relevant. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, Starlink, um, as you're scaling to build more and more Starlink satellites to go on more and more reusable rockets, what are some of the challenges you've had to overcome in Starlink production so that you can perfect that machi machine that builds the machine? Yeah, Star Starlink production is going well, actually. The, that's the, the, that was a hard, that's a hard thing to get right. Um, we made many, we had many iterations on the Starlink prototypes. Uh, and then, as I said, the, the, the building the Starlink production line was, I don't know, thousand percent harder than designing the satellite to begin with. Um, but, but it is important to have like a, um, to, to design for manufacturing and have a, a tight feedback loop between the design of the object and the manufacturing system. So as you, w when, when, when you design the object at first, you, you don't realize all the parts that are really difficult to ma manufacture. Uh, and so, so having the manufacturing system and the design um, bring those up at the same time so that you're actually, in the beginning, making a thing that you know is wrong, but you're actually figuring out what's hard to manufacture. Mm, okay. That's the real problem. Um, so we, we brought up the, the uh, Starlink production line before we actually had the design finalized, which, which is actually the right thing to do. And then we discover, oh, there's all, there's all these things that uh, in the design that are very difficult to make. Um, and so therefore we must change the design. Uh, and the, the, the satellite ended up having the same capability, but just um, was very easy to make um, and launch. So, or real, I'd say very easy, it's, it's, not, it's sort of hard, but, um, <laughs> but, it's, but, but it's being done. And we're, we're, we're ha the, the satellites are being produced at a rate now faster than we can launch them. So, and, and, and the cost of the satellite has dropped below the cost of transporting it to orbit. I, even when taking the, the, a Falcon 9 in the most reused configuration, which is you get the booster back and you get the bearings back. Um, the cost of the tra of transporting the satellite to orbit exceeds the cost of the satellite. Hmm. So the satellite's in a good good situation. Okay. Um, and the cost of that satellite will keep coming down uh, as we ramp up rates and make design improvements. Uh, but so, so we really need Starship to carry Starlink um, in order to get the total delivered cost to orbit. Uh, to be much better than it is today, okay. which is still pretty good. Um. When you, when you, um, so in terms of deciding what to build, um, you can take feedback from customers and let customers <coughs> pull to you what they want, or you can be radically innovative within your company or you know a small set of individuals sure. and develop something and push it into the industrial base. So, customer pull would be. Tesla, uh, Tesla owners wanting new features on uh, the existing fleet. Um, uh, push would be, you know, uh, uh, company push would be something like uh, uh, when Apple pushed the iPad to everybody and nobody knew what an iPad was until they touched it and went, wow, sure. I everybody wants an iPad now. What do you all think about in terms of that balance between uh, customer pull and company push? Well, in, in the beginning, nobody wanted a Tesla. I can tell you that. Uh, the, 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 when we made the ro original sort of roadster sports car, uh, people were like, well, "Why would I want an electric car? That's my gasoline car works fine." Uh, I'm like, "No, electric car is better. I should try it." Um, and it was hard, you know, hard to get people to do a test drive. First, nobody knew who we were. They never heard of this company. I'm like, yeah, we're named after Nikola Tesla. You know that guy? Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for sure we were doing push in the beginning because people said there was no one telling us that they wanted an electric car. So it was not, it was not out of like, you know, it was like lots of people were coming up to me saying, hey, I really want an electric car. I, did, I heard that zero times. Um, <laughs> so people were like, it's like, man, we're going to make an electric car and show that these things can be good. Um, and then people want them. Um, you know, it's like, I think it was like Henry Ford said, uh, like the, you know, 
we were talking about the Model T, it's like if you ask the public what they wanted, they'd say a, fa a faster horse. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you did like a big survey and said, well, hey, public, before automobiles, what would you like? It's like, well, I'd like my horse to go three miles an hour faster and eat less food and, uh, you know, be stronger and live longer and that kind of thing. Um, th there will be basically a, a, a bunch of incremental improvements on horse. Um, because people aren't, we say like, well, what about an automobile, that car that drives itself? Like, what are you talking about? That's, that's not, that's not as crazy. Um, but when you actually make an, an automobile and give it to people and say, okay, now this is a horse where you can keep it in the barn and if you leave for a month, it's still alive. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so carry more, more weight than a horse and go further and that kind of thing. So, anyway, the, it's like w w when, when it's a radically new product, people don't know that they want it because it's just not in their, in their, in their scope. I think when they first started making TVs, they did a nationwide survey. I think this might have been like 46 or 48. It's like a famous nationwide survey. Will you ever buy a TV? And it was like 96% of respondents said no. Hmm. Some, some crazy number. Like basically everyone's like, would you buy a TV? And maybe they put a price in there or something. I don't know. But it was famously, almost everyone said they would not buy a TV. But they didn't know what they're talking about. So the big game-changing stuff at the beginning is a company push kind of a thing most of the time. But yeah. then changes to the product over time can be a lot more customer pull kind of a focus. Yeah, ch changes to the product over time can be uh, incremental changes. Um, then, then, then customers can certainly tell you, it's good to get customer feedback to say, how can we improve the product? Um, and once they're using it, they can say, okay, I like this thing about it, I don't like this other thing, and then we can improve the product over time. Customer yeah. feedback after they, they have the fundamental thing is, is great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, in the audience here, we have uh, a lot of air and space warfighters. We have, uh, uh, so people who use systems. We have a lot of developmental teams on both the government and the industry side, and we have the the air and space leadership of the nation. Um, so I got a little lightning round here for you. Great. Uh, to try and influence maybe some of those younger folks in the back who are looking for the, for the next big thing. So in terms of different kinds of technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or medical or um, uh, batteries or whatever, in the next five years, what technology do you think will see the most advancement? Well, it's difficult to, to assess most in those co contexts because they're very different. But I think the probably the most transformative, most fundamentally transformative will be AI. AI, okay. And if you were recommending to some of the young officers and uh, um, uh, enlisted troops in the room, what sort of degrees to pursue uh, at college or what sort of education that they should uh, prioritize for themselves in the modern era, what would you recommend? Um, computer science and physics. Computer science and physics, okay. How many computer science people do we have out there? How many physics people? Okay, we need more, apparently. Okay. I mean, it's essentially, in information theory and physical theory, um, if you want to understand the nature of the universe um, and have these have a uh, very good predictive power, physics and computer science. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As a nation that is interested in radical innovation to maintain its competitive edge, what are the things that the Department of the Air Force should be investing more in other than reusable rockets? Right. From your perspective. Again, I can't emphasize enough how important reusable rockets are. <laughs> yeah. I, you'll love it. Um, <laughs> um, it it's great. Um, so, um, and, I, and I think you, you could actually do point to point on Earth uh, with, uh, you know, to go long distances um, and be much better than aircraft. Because, um, I mean, basically, just think of like ICBM, 
um, minus the nuke add land, you know. So, so it's just sort of in the option package, just you know, uncheck nuke, and then add landing system. <laughs> <to anchor. laughs> And, and that's definitely going to get you wherever you want to go as fa the, the fastest. Because um, that's why they made ICBMs. They get there the fastest. Um, so you know, I think that, that that's going to be pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, ha ha once you have a dramatically lower cost access to space, then then many things are enabled. Um, you can think of like, once you got the Union Pacific Railroad, then you know getting to the West Coast was um, much faster and much less dangerous. Yeah. You're not likely to sort of end up eating your compatriots in a, in a snowy situation. Uh, you know, so you can just take the train. Um, <laughs> so, so. You know, in the beginning, they thought, "Why the heck are they building that stupid railway? There's nobody. There's nobody there." <laughs> and, and they're like, um, "But once you build the railway, they're like, okay, now it's easy to get to the West Coast, uh, and now a huge portion of the U.S. population is on the West Coast. Um, and actually, California is the most populous state in the nation. Um, but it, it used to be, well, least populous, I suppose, or pretty low." Um, so um, many things are possible once you once the transport uh, problem is solved. Um, so that, that's why I think it's so fundamental. Um, you can't, but if you can't get there, or getting there is takes a long time, and you can't risk, and every, every mission's got to work. Then it's very hard to innovate. Yeah. Um, it's got to be that okay. Some missions won't work, and, the, and the, the cost of running the experiments is low. So that's why I'm har I'm harping so much on the cost of transport. Um, so um, you know, w w once you're there, I think like, like say establishing a base on the moon or base on Mars, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of work work that's needed to create a self-sustaining base on the moon or Mars. And it opens up a tremendous amount of opportunity, just as the Union Pacific Railroad did um, by make, making access to the West Coast um, much easier. Okay. Um, um, yeah. I mean, outside of the space, space realm, I think there's still a lot of opportunity in, in tunnels. I, I've been saying that for a long time. Um, and tunnels are great. Um, they're really great. Um, and uh, the Boring Company is about to finish its first tunnel in Vegas. I encourage, I encourage people to copy, please copy the Boring Company uh, or do better. That'd be great. Um, there's um, a lot of. Yeah. So, in terms of domains, you have subterranean. Yeah. Um, obviously, Tesla. Tesla covers the ground domain uh, as uh, capabilities. You've got the space domain covered with uh, SpaceX and Starlink uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, I think this is, this is the Air Warfare Symposium. Folks might not in the audience might be interested in if you have any ideas for the air domain specifically. Well, for, for the air domain, um, I think uh, things, are, things are, very, are, de are definitely going to go into kind of Autonomous, or, or, lo locally autonomous do, uh, drone warfare is where it's at, where the future will be. Now, I'm, I'm just saying, not, it's not, I want the future to be this. It's just, this is what the future will be, okay. is autonomous drone warfare. Um, and at a, at a, at a local, local level, uh, the, you know, um, I can't, can't believe I'm saying this because this is, this is like dangerous, but it's simply what will occur. Is, is, is sort of a is drones locally being autonomous um, and um, but I think we still want to retain sort of the, the you know authority to d damage or destroy uh, you know anything that that isn't an autonomous drone 
keep that authority back there with the, with the person in the loop. Okay. But it, it's, it's the, the fighter jet era has passed. That is, it's just, yeah, the fighter jet era has passed. Okay. So it's, it's drones. Um, let's go back to failure for a minute and, <laughs> and, and the mindset that, that you have, you and your leadership team at Tesla and SpaceX have on failure. I mean, the SpaceX blooper reel uh, that you guys did in, sure. I think it was 2017 timeframe, um, was definitely, hey, we embrace this learning that occurs. Uh, um, more recently with the, the Tesla truck and the, and the ball through the window, uh, um, uh, also uh, that Didn't mindset, the that, <laughs> that, that, that mindset that embraces yeah. failure, how do you personally, I mean, th it, it, th those kinds of failures would drive a lot of us in this room nuts, but it doesn't seem to drive you nuts. Seems like you're very comfortable with it. Can you talk about the mindset that requires for you to be that accepting of that kind of failure? Uh, sure, what, should we roll the video? No. <laughs> or, should we not? No, we should not roll the video, not yet. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, I, I think of the, these things as just, there's a certain amount of time, and within that time, you want the, the, the best net outcome. So for, you know, all the set of actions that you can do, there's going to be, uh, and some of which will fail, some of which will succeed, and you want the, 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 the net useful output of your set of actions to be the highest. Um, so, um, I mean, that's, like you use like a, a baseball analogy, like, you know, at baseball, they don't let you just sit there and wait for the perf perfect pitch mm -hmm. until you get a real easy one. They even give you three shots. And the third one, they say, okay, and they get off the, they go back to the, put somebody else up there. Um, so you, you three strikes on, on the baseball, um, not, you know, not calling you bad anymore. So, so you, what, you're, what you're really looking for is like, what's the batting average? You know, how are you doing on, uh, on score? Um, and, and just, it, there's gonna be some amount of failure. Um, but you, you want your net output, um, net useful output to be maximized. Failure is essentially irrelevant unless it is catastrophic. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, intellectual property. Obviously, uh, uh, Tesla, SpaceX, Solar City mm -hmm. have um, amazing uh, capabilities that they're bringing to the uh, to the public and to the government uh, every day. How do you protect your intellectual property in a world where it seems like uh, the cloud and servers and things are constantly under attack from people wishing to free you of their your intellectual property? Yeah, well, actually, at, at Tesla, we just uh, open sourced our patents uh, some years ago, so anyone can use our patents. Um, so we really have not been tried to protect intellectual property uh, in that sense. Uh, we've we've tried to actually s smooth the path because um, mm -hmm. the the overarching goal of Tesla is to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, and so if we um, created a patent portfolio that discouraged other companies from making electric cars, that would be inconsistent with our mission. So we open sourced all the patents okay. uh, in order to help the other, anyone else who wants to make an electric car. So I guess that's the opposite of protecting the IP. Um, now, now the, the real way I think you, you actually achieve intellectual property protection is by innovating fast enough. If your rate of innovation is high, then you don't need to worry about protecting the IP um, because other companies will be copying something that you did years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine, you know. Um, just make sure your, your rate of innovation is fast. Um, speed is really, speed of innovation is, is, what, is what matters. Um, and I do, I do say this to my teams like uh, uh, quite a lot, that innovation per unit time, 
as I go, innovation per year, if you want to say it, like, is, is what matters, not innovation absent time. Because if you wanted to make, say, 100% um, improvement in something, and that took 100 years or one year, that's radically different. So um, it's like, what, what is your rate of innovation that, that, that matters? And is the rate of innovation, um, is that accelerating or decelerating? Um, and a, a weird thing happens when companies get big is that most companies um, or organizations, the bigger they get, they tend to get less innovative. Um, not just less innovative on a per person basis, but less innovative in the absolute. Um, and I think this is probably because the incentive structure is not, uh, is not there for innovation. Um, it, it, it's not enough to use words to encourage innovation. The incentive structure must be aligned with that. That's fundamental. So, um. so um, taking that from a business level to a national level in terms of uh, obviously the United States largest economy in the world, China the second largest economy in the world currently and gaining fast. <coughs> what sort of things that could you share with the audience here that um, are your thoughts on the competition, economic or military, uh, between the United States and China? Sure. Um, well, I think China is a real interesting country, I have to say. Um, the, 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 the thing to appreciate about China is just that there's a lot of really smart, really hardworking uh, people there, and they're going to do a lot of great things. Um, this is sort of, you know, independent of, of, of Chinese government policy, they're just going to do a lot of interesting things. Um, uh, the, the thing that will be, that will feel pretty strange is that the Chinese economy is going to be probably at least twice as big as the U.S. economy. Maybe three times, um, but at least twice. Um, uh, so, th and that assumes a, a GDP per capita still less than the U.S. Uh, but uh, since they have about four or five times the population, uh, then it would only require getting to a GDP per capita of half the United States for their economy to be twice the size of ours. Um, and as I'm sure people in this room know, the foundation of war is economics. And so if you, if, if you have half the resources um, of the counterparty, then you better be real innovative. If you're not innovative, you're gonna lose. I'm not sure whether that's a cyber attack that's uh, ongoing or not here, so. Um, the clock says I have 11 minutes left. Is that not true? <coughs> All right, so, so, so now, smooth now, jazz, now Elon. Smooth jazz. Um, it's coming through the house system. We're working to get it shut off. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, well, um, anyway. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, with, with, with respect to China, China's economy is, is going to be two to three times the size of the U.S. economy, at least at least double. Um, so therefore, in order for the U.S. to be competitive on a uh, military level, the innovation has to overcome a gigantic gap in economic output. Okay. So in the absence of radical innovation, the U.S. will be militarily uh, second. Okay. Basic, basic math. What, um, um, from the standpoint of uh, uh, radical innovation, um, we already talked about workforce, we talked about processes, we talked about uh, uh, protecting uh, intellectual property rights. Let's talk about overall culture. That culture that you try and push into your companies that makes them successful. 
um, any of us, and I sat right next to one of your SpaceX employees on the plane here yesterday, uh, a young engineer, um, it was motivating for me just to talk to her about yeah. what she was doing every day and how important her job was. And I just felt like uh, the only other place I've seen that kind of culture is frankly in the Department of the Air Force uh, uh, with some of our young folks that are sprinkled around the back of the room. How do you create that culture at SpaceX and Tesla to, to make employees like that? Well, well this smooth jazz is just on us <laughs> with, a, with a vengeance. Uh, I feel like we're in a big elevator. <laughs> um, so, well, first of all, when, when we interview people, we, we do ask for some evidence of, of exceptional ability, which in most cases in, includes uh, innovation. Uh, this is not to say that everyone needs to be innovative, it's, but we certainly need those that are doing advanced engineering to be innovative. Um, and ideally, everyone is at least some, to some degree innov innovative. Uh, so at the interview point, we select for, for people who, who want to create new technology. And then the incentive structure is set up that, such that uh, innovation is rewarded. Um, making mistakes uh, along the way does not come with a big penalty. Um, and, but, but, but failure to try to innovate mm. at all comes with a big penalty. You'll be fired. Okay. Yeah. All right. The carrot and stick. If, yes. That's the stick. If you don't even try, um, or, or somebody doesn't even try to innovate, or their innovation um, aspirations are, are very, are, are not, not, not very good, then, yeah, they will no longer be at the company. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, we got about five minutes left, and what I'd like to do is just turn it over to you, Elon, to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. If you have a message for the audience here, if you have uh, you know a thousand plus air and space professionals and the greatest uh, air and space force on the planet. So what do you want to tell them? I we we got to make Starfleet happen. <laughs> like, So, so we want like uh, real big spaceships that can go far places, and uh, well, this will probably get me into the most trouble of all. I think this should be a new uniform. That's <laughs> that, you know, um, that that's like uh, I don't know, cool uniforms, cool spaceships. You know, uh, I think that's what when the when the public hears space force, that's what they think. It's like okay, we're gonna have like some. Sweet spaceships and like pretty look good uniforms and stuff. And that'll be that's what the public wants. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we want the sci-fi futures, the the the, the good sci-fi futures to be real, and ideally to become real while we're still alive. You know, and, and we want to see it happen. And so uh, I think we just really need to drive the rate of innovation to be such that we would see. Uh, Big, big breakthroughs, big improvements in space technology, in, in you know, in the years to come. So, yeah, so, like let's try to make Starfleet happen as, as soon as humanly possible, and definitely while we're while we're still alive. Yeah. So, I'm not sure about warp drive, but we can other stuff I think can be done. Gotcha. Not, warp drive and teleportation, probably not, but. Big spaceships that can go far places, definitely, that can be done. Understood. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Elon Musk. <laughs>
right. Wasn't well, that exciting? Just absolutely incredible. And uh, so I see a lot of you exiting. Uh, probably if you've got to go someplace, I would ask that if you could, that you might want to hold on. I mean, it's not completely at the end right now, but uh, I recognize people have flights and everything. Uh, listen, as we close out this year's uh, Air Warfare Symposium, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize our great Air Force leaders again uh, that are here. Uh, and especially for a couple that are here uh, for their last time in the capacity. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Orville, and uh, if you would, and uh, General Golfin, and Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force Wright, if you would please join me on stage. Sir, we've had no two greater leaders to lead our force as a team together. Uh, sir, you came into the Air Force uh, in 1983. Uh, and so to remember uh, your Air Force and our Air Force Association, Orville has a book for you uh, that was the Air Force magazines all put together in this book from 1983. Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force Wright, you came in in 1989 and it's my great pleasure to be able to present you also uh, the almanacs of our, uh, in magazines of 1989 for you. What a great two days of rich discussion of the challenges and issues that are facing our Air Force. I, I hope you have been enjoyed this time as much as I. Uh, the excitement 
the lessons that we have learned, the messages that have been brought by the senior leadership uh, of our Air Force, uh, and today the Spark Tank. Uh, just the innovation uh, that is coming from you, our airmen, uh, across this Air Force. The future of our forces here. Um, one of my uh, former colleagues, uh, Master Sergeant, uh, uh, that is now in junior ROTC, has his class uh, back here in the back that got to witness all of this. And, uh, and every one of them said that they plan to join the United States Air Force when they graduate from high school, either through, their com through going on to college in the commission or directly into our Air Force, our future. Uh, that is here, and we couldn't be happier and prouder for the opportunity to be uh, supporting you. We also want to thank uh, the cadets of the University of Central Florida for their assistance, uh, uh, our industry partners, and I thank all of you for joining us as well. As always, we appreciate your continued support. We hope you've learned a lot about this press at, uh, at this professional education program sponsored by your association. If you like what you've seen here, I invite you again to be a member of this great association so we may continue to support our Air Force and be the force behind the force now and into the future. Again, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you in September the 14th through the 16th. Put that on your calendar in the National Harbor in Washington, D.C. for the AFA's Air, Space, and Cyber Space Conference. Safe travels to all of you. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, this includes AFA's 36th Air Warfare Symposium.